Mm. Well, I've got uh, I've got ten o'clock, so let's fire away. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to intrusion detection on the cheap. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Gary Smith. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory over in Richland, Washington, over on the dry side of the state. If you're not sure where that is geographically, it's where the Columbia, the Yakima, and the Snake all meet and then turns abruptly to the left and heads out towards Portland. So that's where we are geographically. We don't get a lot of rain over on our side of the, of the state. We get maybe five to 10 inches of rain a year. Uh, we have plenty of sunshine. We get on the average 400 days of sunshine a year. <laughs> yeah, wonder, and you wonder how we do that. Well, so do I. Um, as I mentioned, I work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. That's a laboratory that's uh, run by the Department of Energy. We do a lot of things with biology. We do a lot of thing, environmental stuff, especially aerosol and air chemistry. We do a lot of basic uh, research on um, things having to do with proteins and catalyzing things, uh, a lot of stuff having to do with hydrogen as a fuel and how you store it. Um, lots of different things and this is all funded by the Department of Energy's uh, Department of Science. And to do a lot of the processing of all of this data, we have a supercomputer. Um, it's, it's getting a little bit old and long in the tooth. It's approaching uh, three years old, it'll be technically three years old in November, and but it's still in the top 500. It's in, it's still in the top 100 even. It's got, uh, uh, it has approximately 20,000 disks in it, um, and 16,000 cores. So there's plenty of processing there, power there yet. Uh, my responsibility is I'm responsible for the security of the supercomputer and all the infrastructure associated with it. <coughs> There's my email address. I'm in the uh, molecular science computing, which is part of the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory um, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, if you have any questions after this is over, and you probably will, Send me an email. Okay. Um, how many people here have ever gotten a free puppy or a free dog? Um, same, same syndrome. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Yeah, it's the same thing. It. How, how free was it? Well, not very. Right. It wasn't very free, was it? Um, there, the, there's. Uh, you, you get the free dog, and you gotta, you gotta have it vaccinated, and you gotta buy water dishes, and you gotta buy dog food, and by all the time all of this is rolled up, it's, um, it's not, it's not so free. And there's a lot of care and maintenance that goes with the free puppy. Uh, when you get it set up, well, setting up an IDS, an intrusion detection system, is very much like that free puppy, the free puppy syndrome. There's a lot of upfront care and feeding and maintenance and ongoing maintenance that you have to do with it. Um, I had the extremely good fortune to be taught SNORT, which is probably the premier intrusion detection uh, piece of software out there. It's free. Um, I had the opportunity to be taught Snort by none other than Snort's creator, Marty Roach. And he said, he's a very wise individual, not only in terms of his knowledge of intrusion detection, but also the, the whole routine of getting it started and set up. And he said, when you put in an IDS, if anybody asks you during that first month how it's going, tell them it's going fantastic. 
even if it isn't, because you're going to find out all kinds of things about your network that you didn't know before, and you're going to have to turn lots of knobs and do all sorts of tuning on your IDS to get it to where it's not just overwhelming you with large amounts of information that you probably don't really want to know. So it's, it's quite a learning experience to get one going. Um, but does it really have to be that way? Does it really have to be this hair-pulling, uh, nerve-wracking kind of thing where you're constantly getting alerted and having all of these troubles? Well, I don't think so. And that's what we're going to look into. Um, here are the tools of the trade that I had, I used, when I set up an IDS system on my network back at PNNL. I started out with Fedora 14. Originally, when I first set it up, I was using Fedora 13, but Fedora 14 came along, and I migrated to Fedora 14. That's the base OS and all the underlying utilities. Then, to capture impressive things that are happening on the network, I'm using PSAD, which stands for Port Scan Activity Detector. That's the scanner and the detector and the analyzer that I'm using, rather than just using plain old snort. I'm using a companion utility that goes with it called FW Snort. FW Snort is a in really incredible tool. It takes snort rules which can be fairly complicated, and turns them into IP tables rules for Linux. So that now you're getting all the benefit of the IP tables and Snort without all of that tremendous nerve-wracking overhead that goes into it. For reporting on things, I'm using LogWatch. LogWatch is... Uh, a nice piece of open source software that tells, that looks through your log files, summarizes them, and gives you a very concise report about what's going on. For protecting the system itself, because this is an IDS box, and if somebody attacks your IDS box, you certainly want to know about it. I'm using a program called RK Hunter. RK Hunter stands for Rootkit Hunter. It is an integrity checker. It looks for the fingerprints of various rootkits, detects anomalous behavior that may have been introduced to your system as a result of a compromise. For logging, my personal choice is syslogng. Uh, it's much better than your plain old stock syslog. It gives you uh, excellent filtering capabilities. That's basically the whole of the software stack that I'm using. Um, now, as far as hardware goes, um, I had this Dell 1851 use server that had long since more or less outlived its usefulness. Um, it's not great or fantastic or anything. It's long since been paid for, and it was going to be excess. But by turning it into an IDS box, it got a new lease on life. It's got two processors, it's got a fair amount of memory, um, it's got a reasonable amount of storage, it's got some nice adapters on it, um, it's got hardware RAID built into it. It's not a bad box. It's not really not a bad box. And by turning it into just an idea, into an IDS box, um, it got a new lease on life. Okay, let's talk about the individual pieces of software that I put on here and how they're layered on and what they're good for. Um, for an OS distribution, I used Fedora 14. Originally it was Fedora 13, but when 14 came out, I migrated it to 14, and when 15 comes out, I'll do the same. Um, I'm not from around here. I, I came here about six or seven years ago. I came here from Dallas, Texas, and one of the things that we talk about in Texas is one of our favorite expressions is them's fighting words. Usually that's associated with oil, water, or state income tax. Um, so when I say 
Them's fighting words. That could very well be a fighting word for some people. SC Linux. Uh, it's one of those things that you probably either you love it, you hate it, or you see it and you run in the opposite direction. Um, I used to uh, I used to be a chemist in my first job, and we dealt with a lot. The chemical company I worked for we dealt with a lot of chlorine gas, and the rule was is that if you see a yellow orange cloud, run the other way. Well, that's some people's reaction to SE Linux, um, but. SE Linux in Fedora 14 and Fedora 13 probably has the best, most up-to-date SE Linux targeted policy you can get. That's why I chose Fedora 14 and 13. Yes, sir? Fedora is the one that's upgraded every six months. Fedora is the one that's upgraded every six months. It's where you find, uh, it's where the developers really put in all of the new uh, leading edge and leading edge stuff. With not CentOS, which is a cousin that is Right. So, CentOS is based on the current release of Red Hat. Fedora is the is what will probably be in Red Hat at some point in the future. So it's really the the cutting edge of, of would stuff. Avoid upgrading every six months would not send us the a better choice. Um, yeah, and it lags behind, but they're they're both free. Uh, you had a question, sir. I was going to say that Ubuntu is also every six months. I'm sorry. Ubuntu. Uh, why, why not Ubuntu? Or no, I just said it's also every six months. Yeah, it's also every six months, right? Um, okay. Um, one of the reasons I picked Fedora is that um, Fedora has a checkbox on it on the install that says "Do a minimal install." For uh, for any kind of high security kind of box. You don't want to have a large vulnerability footprint. You don't want to have a lot of services running on it that someone can exploit. Do you need X? No. Do you need printer services? No. There's a whole lot of things that you don't need when you're doing a security box like something running on like an IDS. So if you can get by with the least amount of things possible, the better. And it is much easier to start with something with a very small fingerprint and slowly build things up rather than taking a very large fingerprint and starting to collapse them down because then you start getting into uh, with, with what I call uh, RPM hell. You want to get rid of package A but you can't get rid of package A because package B depends on it and so on down the line. So if you start with something small and slowly layer on what you want, sort of like a tree growing where you, the rings expand out, it's much easier to keep control of things rather than trying to take that big ring and cut it down. So that's why I picked Fedora 14 was that uh, ability to put on a very small number of packages and just 190 packages in the minimal install. 190, can you really believe that, that you can get by with that few packages and actually have a real running system? That's great. You got a very small footprint. You layer on what you don't, what you need rather than trying to remove the stuff. Okay, let's talk about port scan activity detector. PSAD is written by a fellow named Michael Rush and it is a very lightweight system for determining if somebody is scanning your system. Uh, it's got a few utilities, most, uh, one of them is written in Perl, most of them are written in C, and it's designed to work with IP tables so that you can detect port scanning traffic. Um, it incorporates many of the TCP, UDP, and ICMP signatures from SNORT so that uh, a particular signature happens to come across and it will alert you about it. It also has another nice feature in it, um, passive OS fingerprinting. That way you can uh, know what sort of system is coming in to try to look at your system. Um, 
If you've ever looked at the RFCs for TCP, there's actually a lot of leeway in uh, how different situations are supposed to be handled. For instance, the, the time to live value uh, in the TCP protocol, that's how, uh, how long a packet can travel around the network before somebody throws up their hands and says, boy, you're never going to make it, and sends a, starts sending a message back that says, host unreachable. Well, the spec says, yes, you will have a time to live value, but it doesn't say what that time to live value is, and different OSs and even different releases in different OSs handle that time to live value differently. So based on what the time to live value is, you can, and some other things, you can make a guess about uh, the operating system on the other end that's trying to uh, scan your system. Okay. Um, for PSAD to work, you just need to define two very simple rules in IP tables. Just say everything that comes in on input, I want to log it, I want to log the TCP options and the log level is info. Anything that comes in for forwarding, same thing. That's all you have to do to make PSAD work. Um, okay. For PSAD to really work properly, um, you need to send all the messages as, cur as current info, and you need to send it to this name pipe. PSAD, when it's up and running, will read everything that syslog sends out to that pipe and pick it up. Now, if you're using syslog ng like me, it's real easy to set this up. Set your destination and just give it a name. And say it's a pipe, and there's the name of the pipe. And then log. Log everything that's a system source and filtering on the kernel and the destination is pset. Put that in your syslog ng, start syslog, and you're good to go. Bingo. Okay, um, remember I mentioned that I was using SE Linux, that's the reason I've got that is to have a very secure IDS box in case one of my demons goes nuts or in case somebody compromises one of the demons running on the system, uh, it will provide a measure of, of um, security for it. Well, um, SE Linux is written by humans and the policies are written by humans and consequently um, the, the policies are not necessarily perfect. But, um, so when I first started getting this going, I fired up PSAD after getting it all set up and it didn't work. And I saw that I was getting SE Linux errors. Well, uh, I had to write a little bit of additional policy. Uh, I say I wrote it, uh, I didn't actually write this. Um, SE Linux uh, on Fedora and Red Hat has this wonderful little utility called audit to allow. Um, what it does is that takes the error messages relating to policy violations and turns them into a policy that you can then use to allow things. So bingo, there it is. Now PSAID is all, all hunky-dory. Well, almost. Um, remember I said that PSAD communicates through that name pipe? Well, I had to make a policy addition so that PSAD could uh, send to that named pipe. Again, the same thing. I get access violations in SE Linux. I run audit to allow. That generates me a policy file. I load the policy file and now everything is happy. Yay, PSAD's up and going, and uh, it's got the basic snort rules, and I'm off and going. Okay, let's talk about the next piece, FW snort. FW snort takes snort rules and turns them into IP tables rules, so you don't have to run snort at all. Um, this is a really, a really neat utility. Um, you can uh, no, take the snort rules, and if you're interested in just a small subset, you can 
chop out the particular rules that you want, but I just take them all. Um, that creates a file called Etsy FWSnort, FWSnort.sh. That has all the IP tables rules. You can put that into Etsy RC.local at startup so that when your system starts up, it loads all those rules. Um, and uh, FWSnort was also written by uh, Mr. Rash. Um, it was originally written based on some code by another security researcher named uh, William Stearns. Let's take a, a brief look at SW, FW Snort. This is a Snort rule um, for HTTPS and if somebody is trying to run an attack where they download some code and run GCC to compile the code, Snort will detect this. FW Snort turns this into this particular IP tables rule. So if someone is trying to do this particular attack where they're trying to download some code and running the GCC command to compile the code that they've surreptitiously stuck on your system, FW Snort will alert you to this. Pretty neat. Um, I'll talk about where you get the rules from uh, a little bit later on. Overhead by not running Pardon? <coughs> by not running snort, they have a lower overhead? Oh yes, this is much lower overhead. This is much lower overhead, much less noisy, um, much easier to deal with. But well, you grab the latest snort rule set. Oh yes, um, uh, you can get the latest, and in fact I talk about, uh, talk about that. Um, download the latest uh, snort rules from emerging threats.org and download the latest uh, PSAD stuff from the PSAD site. Do that once a, once a week. Load the new rules, restart PSAD and FW snort in a cron job and you're good to go. Easy. Um, let's look at what a sample PSAD report looks like. Um, there's the version number and it tells me, oh gee, uh, somebody's running ping against your site. There's the IP address of uh, the most uh, of the top 25 attackers and this was fairly early into, into a week so there's not much going on. Um, one of the things that PSAD does and this is configurable in its uh, configuration file is that you can set a danger level from one to five, five being the most dangerous, one being the least dangerous on, on activity. So if uh, this particular attacker generated a whole lot more of this particular type of uh, uh, scan, it could elevate the danger level up to three and let you know about this. And it tells you how many packets and what the signature was. It tells you the top 20 scan ports. Uh, UDP 138. Anybody know what that one is right offhand? Uh, UDP 138, that's good old NetBIOS. That's Microsoft NetBIOS. 137, more NetBIOS junk. 161, SNMP. What does SNMP stand for? That's one. My personal opinion is it stands for security, not my problem. <laughs> Yeah, um, some other packets there and I have no idea what that one is. Uh, that was just some anomalous behavior and gives you uh, a basic rundown on where it's coming from and it tells you um, a status line down here at the end and it's told me that it's emailed me once that I've gotten an alert. Okay, um, so we've talked about the basic underlying OS, which is Fedora 14. We've talked about FW Snort. We've talked about PSAD. Also for alerting me, I use LogWatch. LogWatch watches your logs. Um, it's open source software. It's very easy to use. Uh, if you have uh, an RPM or YUM, you can just do YUM install LogWatch. And generally speaking, the um, 
uh, default rules right out of the box will work for you. No modifications necessary. Um, now, um, Giles is the name of the of the system that I have for um, for doing all of this. Uh, anybody here a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan? Yes, maybe. Okay. What was Giles? who was Giles? Okay, and what was the name of the organization that he belonged to? He was the Watchers, yes, he was part of the Watchers, and that's, what, that's the function Giles does. Giles is a watcher. He watches my network. And I, I didn't point this out, but Giles has two network interfaces on them, and they're both connected. One of them is connected to the public network, that quote-unquote public network there uh, in, in, my, in my domain there at PNNL. The other one is connected to some dark space. This is an old unused network that's still there. It's still connected to a router, but basically there's nothing on it. If something happens that I start getting alerts on that dark space, somebody's where they shouldn't be. If they're on the dark space, that's bad. Yes, sir? It's like your honeypot. Um, sort of like a honeypot, but I'm not, I'm just looking for the traffic. I'm not, I'm not trying to lure somebody in. I'm just interested in detecting if they're there. And if they're there on the dark space, well, they obviously shouldn't be there. This is worth knowing. But I'm not, I'm not, I have no, I have no lures or advertisements. I'm just looking at the traffic. So that's, you just look for someone that's randomly generating routes that are available within your space and so they would get out there without being advertised? Um, occasionally, I, occasionally the, the router will generate um, um, an IGMP message. And I just let that fall. On. I just filter that out and let that fall on the floor. Something other than than say a, a router message, uh, an IGMP type of message would would give me some cause for concern. But that's a good question. Um, you were talking about um, um, the. Um, well, I, I, let me back up just a minute. I have, I have LogWatch set up to do two things. I have it set up to send me a daily report, and I also have it set up to send me a weekly report. So um, LogWatch is very easy, and like I say, uh, the defaults right out of the box will work for you. About the only thing you'll have to change is where to send the email alerts. Um, you were asking about the signatures. Um, you can get the latest PSED signatures from this IP address at cipherdyne.org, PSED signatures. Download those once a week. You can get the latest SNORT rules from emergingthreats.net and run FWSNORT to generate a new, SNORT a new set of uh, SNORT rules. Do this once a week. You've got the latest and greatest. Put the Synchron job. You don't have to think about it, it just automatically happens. And you're, you're, great, you're good to go. Let's take a look at what a sample log watch looks like. It gives you a very concise, a very nice summary of systems and uh, how many packets on what ports that it's sent. Uh, it gives you a nice total. This is my, uh, this is my dark space here that I was talking about. And as you can see, I get a lot of IGMP messages, but I just let those fall on the floor. That's just the router sending out routes on that particular piece of, on that particular segment. I'm not really interested in those, but if I saw other traffic other than Internet Gateway Management Protocol uh, stuff, that would let me know that somebody was on that dark space uh, segment, and they shouldn't be. A little further down, I got... It summarizes um, uh, logins. 
that's me. I can't type. Can't type my password right. <laughs> um, it monitors SUs. There's me going to SU to do a little bit of maintenance. And there it is telling me, yes, dummy, you can't type your login. And there I, foot, I futzed it three times. Um, tells me where I was logging in from. Uh, there's me logging and not being able to log in properly through SSH, where I'm coming from, what username I was trying to log in. Um, just as a little point of information. For those of you that were in my talk yesterday where I was talking about different ways of detecting root being able to do things, tracking roots activity. Yes, indeed, I do in fact have root level tracking on Giles, the same as I do on all of the other infrastructure that I'm responsible for. So uh, this is not a case of the cobbler's children has no shoes. Giles reports syslog, uh, uh, roots activity to syslog just like all the other ones do. And a little bit of stuff there at the end, and it gives me a good indication of, of how my space is being used. Um, as you can see, uh, there's the raw amount of disk that's available. That's how much is actually getting used. As I said, this doing it this way, where I start with a minimal system and just layer a few things on top of it, I got plenty of space out there, and I don't have a very large footprint. I have a very small attack surface if somebody figured out, oh, gee, Smith's got an IDS out there. I need, to, uh, I, need to, I need to hack it so that he doesn't know that I'm doing something bad. To protect the system, I use something called RK Hunter. RK stands for rootkit. Um, everybody here kind of familiar with rootkits? Uh, the idea behind a rootkit is, is that somebody breaks into your system, loads some code onto it that is going to disguise their presence through any number of mechanisms. Um, rootkit Hunter, I've set it up to run as a, as a uh, cron job. Uh, you can run it from the command line also, but I have it set up to run as a cron job. Um, you do have to have the bash shell, and you do need Perl, but that's all you really need. Um, RK Hunter looks for files that are frequently created by rootkits. Uh, bogus uh, files in slash dev, that's a frequent trademark of rootkit activity. Um, lots of times, uh, rootkits involve replacements of um, standard utilities, for instance, PS, LS. LS has been tricked up so that it won't show certain files that have been created by the rootkit. PS to show processes that the intruder may have put on, not to show up. Those are frequently trademarks that you have had a rootkit put there. Um, RK Hunter, when you first set it up, goes through and checksums these very vital system files, and then every time it runs, rechecksums the ones that are out there, and if something has changed, it lets you know about it. Now, um, I also have YUM set to uh, update things, but and occasionally YUM will tell, uh, RK Hunter will tell me that some important system file has changed, so what I do is I then go back and look through the YUM log to see if that is some activity associated with that. But that doesn't happen very often because I don't have very much that requires updating. So I get those very, very infrequently. Um, it also looks, it looks to see if your shadow file has changed. Has your password file changed? Um, a, uh, an intruder may put a bogus account into your system. This would let you know that someone had done that. Um, hidden files, files that start with a dot. RK Hunter looks for the presence of those in certain directories. Um, it's, it's a very handy program for checking the integrity of your system. Let's look at what RK Hunter looks like. Uh, it tells you what version, when it started. It checks the configuration and tells you that um, it started 
it gives you the parameters that you set up and uh, the information about the database and the script. Um, now we come to the proof in the pudding. Is this useful? Yes, it is very useful. Um, sometimes machines just get misconfigured by virtue of the system manager. He may do something and he's had a bad day or he's, uh, he's uh, my problem, fumble fingers when he's typing something and he may end up misconfiguring a system so that uh, it's now doing something that it shouldn't. Giles being my IDS machine will let me know about it. Um, frequently, um, we have red teams come into PNNL and they will set up uh, boxes to do scanning to see what's running out there on our network. Well, Giles detects this and Giles lets me know about it. I can then take that information to our unclassified computer security people and say, hi, did you know that these particular, that, that we're, that people are scanning from these particular addresses and they're scanning for these particular things? Oh, oh yes, oh, okay, can you email that to me? Sure, right away. So, yes indeed it is very useful. Um, if somebody is running a scan and they shouldn't be, this will let me know. It is very useful. Um, I think it's, a, and, and the best thing about it is, is that I don't really have to maintain it. There's very little that I have to maintain. The updates to PSAD and the snort rules happen automatically. Um, the reports. I just can look at, I can look at those in less than five minutes every morning. It's really great. It doesn't take a lot of work. It doesn't take a lot of tuning. And the hardware was already there, so there wasn't any expense there. Uh, useful links. If you want to snap up Fedora, you can get Fedora from there. P said the port scan activity detector. There's a link for it. FW Snort is by the same guy. You can get it from there. Logwatch, you can get that off of SourceForge. You can get RK Hunter off of SourceForge. Syslog NG, there's a link for it. Um, so, an IDS, it doesn't have to be like a free puppy. It doesn't require lots of tuning. It doesn't require lots of effort. It doesn't require lots of expense, lots of care and feeding and updates. If you've got some old hardware sitting around, it doesn't take very much to do it because all it's doing is listening. It's looking for people to come along and come knocking on your door. Okay, that's all I have. My questions? Yes, sir. The number of IPs that are, are attacking you, you have a way of stopping that? Um, yes, uh, PSAD has actually uh, two personalities. Uh, one is detection and the other one is response. I haven't set up any response in there um, because I'm interested in just seeing what's out there. But yes, you can, um, in the configuration file for PSAD, have it respond to a particular uh, type of problem. For instance, you can say that if uh, my danger level on this particular thing gets above a certain level, do something. Like for instance, run a script that uh, inserts an IP tables rule that says I'm not going to uh, accept any more traffic from this particular IP address. So there is, there is that response capability within PSET. I'm, I'm not using it. I'm interested in um, seeing what's out there and establishing uh, footprints for what's going on on my network. And by seeing um, what is uh, quote unquote normal, I can look at the reports and see what's abnormal. Of course, PSAD and FW Snort will both alert me if something really weird happens. 
um, like for instance um, uh, not too long ago somebody on the other side of the street in unclassified computer security decided that it was a good I would be a good idea to scan for printers that are using SNMP uh, again security not my problem well I found out about this right away poof there's this message from PSA. Oh, this IP address is doing an, SM, an SNMP sweep against it, against Giles. Okay, let me track this down and find out what's going on. Turns out they were looking for, for printers. They're just doing a, a part of their part of their job of looking for rogue printers out there. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, so your IDS box is actually your firewall. Is that correct? No, it's not a firewall at all. Because you have a firewall and an IDS box? I have a, I have a, there's a, the, a firewall is maintained out there beyond that scheme. This is, this is on my internal network to pick up anomalous activity within that. Um, I know that a lot of um, noise gets made about all of these attacks that come in from outside, outside on the internet, these guys that, that break in. Um, the real threat still is the people that you have granted access to on the inside. That insider threat is probably still the, the most real threat that anybody has to deal with these days. Okay, so, but still running IP tables. Right, and that's right, and that that's uh, that's how FW Snort does its thing. Uh, yes, sir. So, is, is your IDS box configured as a gatekeeper to your network? Is all traffic coming to your internal network pass through this box and then out the other side? No, it's just it's just there with big ears listening away. It uh, it nothing passes through it. It's just listening. Well, it's um, it's running. It's it's got the interface in promiscuous mode, so everything is it sees everything there. What, what is the architecture looks like? Then? What is what is the architecture looks like? Then you were just listening passively to nothing. Basically, that's it. I'm just listening. Pardon? What is the purpose of doing that? Of just listening. You do nothing. I know what normal traffic, just listening, I should know what my normal, tra my basic normal traffic should look like. If something unusual pops up, I know that that's something out of the ordinary. I know that that's a, an indication of uh, potentially malicious traffic or in, the, ca in the, the case I described, somebody doing their job on the other side of the street. Any, any, have you found any malicious traffic? Um, no, not, I haven't really found any malicious traffic. I found traffic that looked malicious, but it was because, in several instances, it was because a, uh, a system manager had, uh, had fumble fingered something. Human foolishness, right? Um, yeah, not, yeah, not, not malicious, just fumble fingers. Yeah. And, and one of the things you have to learn in security is don't ascribe to malicious intent what can be put down to uh, stupidity. Um, yes, sir? So if I'm a malicious insider and I'm targeting a specific server in your environment that I want to attack, does your IDS can see any of that traffic? It's, I, I'm hoping that it will. Yes, I'm assuming you're on a switch network, so... I'm on a switch network, but I'm, I still see a lot of traffic coming through. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you're just setting up a system like this, what are some tips and techniques to kind of determine anomalous versus actual intrusions? Um, probably the best the, the 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 best tip I can give you on that one is um, a very tried and true old old adage of um, what I call the five golden principles of security: know your system, uh, know what your traffic looks like 
and that's what this will tell you in your daily reports is you'll see what what is pretty much normal for your system. Just kind of recognize that because um, the, the best intrusion detection piece of equipment out there is right up here. We, we try very hard to put that into computers and it's very hard to do but humans are very good at that. The bad part about it is, is that they're slow and they like to sleep. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, we do, we do make those fumble fingers with, with, the, with the typing. But uh, by, by seeing the reports come through on a daily basis, and, and, and what I, what's interesting is right up there at the front, and you see, okay, this is, this is what a normal day looks like, and pretty soon you, you know what, what normal for your network looks like. And it's real easy to just to pick that out. Had a, another question over here? Yes, sir. Well, th this is, looks like a great IDS, which is what you're here to present. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I realized is that to be listening is such an awesome thing because you're, first of all, knowing your network. Um, and second of all, you might actually discover something you don't want to see. Um, the, the other piece to the success, though, of the system is having that firewall at the front end. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you manage? And is what I guess how, how does that piece fit into this piece? Um, actually, I don't manage the the firewall that's out there at the at the perimeter. Uh, another group manages that for us. Um, what I'm I'm interested in is is anomalous things on my network inside, uh, trying to catch that insider threat. Um, trying to catch uh, somebody, perhaps uh, you know, they, they, the disgruntled employee. Um, they may they may see some uh, uh, news about some particular new exploit, and they download. They think, oh, gee, wow, this is neat. Download the exploit code, and they they try running it against some of our systems in in either the infrastructure or the supercomputer. Maybe they're they, we have a lot of researchers there, and they think, oh, well, hey, this is cool. Let me try this. Well, no, that's not really that cool to try that. <laughs> um, you're, you're potentially, you're potentially uh, do, you, know, you, you think a denial of service attack might be interesting to try. Well, it's not so interesting for the people who are trying to get work done. <laughs> um, oh, gee, well, look at what I can do. Wow, that's neat. Sorry, that's, that's not... That's not good practice. Have you ever intentionally run something like backtrack against yourself just to see how good it is? Uh, yes, good it yes, is. and in fact, um, when I first had Giles set up, um, I did not exclude it from my normal Nessus runs where I go through and do the big sweep against all the systems in the infrastructure and the supercomputer and whatnot. Well, Giles lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, look at all of these, look at all of these uh, 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 usernames that are trying to log in, Root's trying to log in, and all of these other things. Oh, look at all of these other um, uh, things that people are trying to do. They're doing port scans. They're trying, uh, they're trying HTTP attacks. They're trying all of this, and it lit up literally like a Christmas tree. And all of a sudden, I had all of this email. Oh no! Okay. First thing we do, we get rid of all of these alerts because I'm not really interested in them. But I guess I know that everything. That gee, look at all of this stuff that fired. Don't scan Giles. <laughs> Don't make that mistake again. Yes, uh, that was kind of a um, an interesting little. Uh, I didn't think about that at the time. I didn't really think. Oh, okay. Well, I've got this IDS box out there, and I'm going to scan. I'm going to have the scan automatic scan take place that lets me know if, if things have have deteriorated on the network. And it sure enough lit up like a Christmas tree and I think, okay, well, that works well. I just don't need to do this again. I need to, uh, if I'm going to look at Giles and make sure that he has good integrity, I don't need to do it this way because I'm, <laughs> I'm just, 
I'm just, I just ended up spamming myself with lots of messages. But, and in fact, I, I was rather surprised when that happened because, hmm, gee, I didn't realize Nessus tested for this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. Okay, that's really pretty neat. Okay, now well, I'm getting my money out of Nessus, getting good value for them. Um, you, you had a question. Right, when you said internal network, you're basically talking about a closed network. A closed network. Uh, it's not connected to the internet, so you don't really have to worry about what the firewall's doing. That's somebody else's responsibility. That's somebody else's responsibility. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for anomalous traffic inside. Uh, inside. On a closed network. On a closed network. And, and on that dark space where, where I know nobody should be. Uh, you had a question, sir. You have your IDS set up to send its logs to your log server? Yes, yes. Why are you running LogWatch on the IDS as opposed to um, well, uh, I want, if I ran it on the log server, I would get a lot of information about all of the other systems that were logging to it. You couldn't configure it just for the specific log? Uh, I probably could, but, um, you know, I was, I was lazy. Uh, I, I knew that I could install LogWatch on Giles and just have it send, just have the output sent to me, rather than try to configure it on my on my log on my centralized log host. That that you can just attribute to just being lazy, and but that that, that is a, a, a possibility for something down the road. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you make sure that the RK Hunter hashes have been compromised? Um. It actually does checks against itself. But are you storing the hashes on another system and then turning against that? No, it unfortunately it, it stores them on itself. So it's not it's not perfect. Um, but it does have its own integrity checks that it does do up front. Um, it also I also have it set up that uh, if there's an update to any of its signatures, it pulls those down when it runs, and that runs once a week. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Have you ever had to uh, customize any of the signatures, or do the defaults and updates just work for you? The, the defaults and the updates just work for me. Um, I haven't had to customize any of them, which, which is another great thing. Um, I don't have to. I don't have to do any work. They just, the cron job just downloads them off of those sites, runs against the new set of rules, pops them into the tables, restarts, restarts PSAD, restarts FW Snort, bingo, I'm all set. Really nice. I don't have to go through and, and, and weed rules out or say, well, this is trash. I just, I just take the defaults and it works great. If you had to do that, you wouldn't. Pardon? If you had to do that, you wouldn't. If I had to, if I had to do that, it wouldn't, that would start falling into that free puppy syndrome. And it, uh, some of the value of being able to have this as a nice, easy way of, of getting this stuff would be, well, the, it would be somewhat devalued. You had a question, oh, sir. Would you make your presentation available on the uh, Linux Fest? Uh... I have a, a CD to give to the, um, uh, the the Grand Vizier or whatever he is, and he can put it out there for us. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you had a question, sir? I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation.